She was going to kill me. She was a psychopathic killer. There's not a doubt in my mind she is no serious fellow. A prostitute claims she had no choice when she killed seven men in Florida. Was it self-defense or murder? From opening statement to verdict, tonight, Aileen Warner, serial killer or victim? I had to immediately shoot. He was going to kill me. This woman is standing trial for murder. Her name is Eileen Warner. I said at the start that she was a, uh, a uh, predatory prostitute. Now we can add to that she was a psychopathic killer uh, without remorse. State Attorney John Tanner says Eileen Warnos is a murderer, that she methodically worked the highways of Central Florida as a prostitute, selling herself, then murdering and robbing her clients. Law enforcement says if convicted, she will be the first female serial killer, the first in the history of American crime. She is not a serial killer beyond the shadow of any doubt. Eileen Warnes is not a serial killer. The cops have dubbed her as such. She is not a serial killer. I do not know what happened. We'll all be finding out in the courtroom. Arlene Praley is Eileen Warnes' biggest supporter. Drawn to her through religion, she recently legally adopted Warnes as her daughter. She says even though Warnes has admitted killing seven men, it's not murder, but self-defense. She said, do you really think God's going to let the truth come out? And I said, I'm sure God will have the truth come out. Just don't be frightened. Know that truth will stand the test of time. Lies are very soon exposed. That's from Proverbs. And I believe that. I feel our public defenders will bring the truth out. And I do believe the jury will believe the truth. Many prostitutes are controllers. They're manipulators. Uh, uh, some are very lustful people, enjoy multiple sexual partners. And uh, they exercise tremendous control over the men who uh, who become their clients. Uh, I think she's a controller. I think she's a manipulator. Uh, uh, but the desire to control, I think, uh, has gone gone the limit now. Uh, that desire uh, moved over into the area of uh, taking lives. Although charged with four additional murders and a suspect in two others, Eileen Warnus is on trial in this courtroom in Deland, Florida for just one, that of Richard Mallory, a 51-year-old shop owner. Prosecutors say in the fall of 1989, Eileen Warnus hitched a ride with Mallory. They say she promised him sex and in a secluded spot, shot him to death. Later, they say, he pawned his belongings. Prosecutors will argue that Eileen Warnus should be found guilty of first-degree murder, the premeditated murder of Richard Mallory. If they can't prove premeditation, they'll argue that Warnos is guilty of felony murder, killing Mallory while committing another felony, in this case, robbery. But the defense will argue that it is Eileen Warnos who is the victim here, a victim of life on the streets. They'll argue that she was abused and that she suffers from severe mental problems, but that foremost, she was forced to defend herself against Richard Mallory. In the next two hours, you will hear testimony on both sides of this story and decide for yourself if Eileen Warner should be given the death penalty for killing Richard Mallory. Good morning. Good morning. Prosecutor John Tanner opens the case for the state. My name is Carol Warner. He is charged with murder in first degree by premeditation and by committing robbery felony as well as armed robbery. The evidence that we believe will be revealed during the trial of the next several days shows that on November 30th, 1989, a little two years ago, Richard Mallory, age 51, turned east on the I-4 near State Highway, near Tampa. He didn't know that he was living the last day of his life. He didn't know that in less than 10 hours, he was robbed, murdered, and his body was left rotten right in the woods. Of course, he didn't know that he was about to pick up a predatory prostitute that had sex with over 250,000 men by her own admission. He didn't know that he was about to admit and meet and admit in his car. Eileen Carol Warner. And then they began 
to move towards the ultimate act of having sex. But he wouldn't take his clothes off. He wanted to just unzip his pants. And she didn't like it that way. And they began to argue and struggle a little bit about it. And she got out of the car and said, no, you're not going to just pay me. You're going to pay me. And then she shot him and he sat behind the wheel. In both stories, as she talks about the killing, she admits that he was sitting in the automobile behind the wheel, fully clothed, when she shot him. And that she was out of the automobile with a loaded nine-shot revolver in his hand. And he was no weapon weapon. <coughs> Ultimately, and the bottom line is, the evidence in its totality would show that Irene Carol Warnus liked control. She had been exercising control for years over men. Tremendous power from Jack through prostitution. She had devised a plan now and carried it out to have the ultimate control. All that Richard Mowry had, she took, including his life, under the law. Under the law. She must pay with her life. Lead public defender Tricia Jenkins begins the defense for Eileen Warner. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is going to show that when Eileen Wernus jumped into the car with Richard Mallory on that rainy night in December of 1989, she had no idea that she was going to be traveling with him into a nightmare and that that ride would ultimately bring her into this courtroom today. You are going to hear evidence that Lee has been on her own since she's been a very small child. You will hear that she's been living on the road. You're going to hear that she's a prostitute, living from one highway exit to the next. <coughs> You're also going to hear that home for her, as the prosecutor has indicated to you, is a motel. When times are good, she rents a motel by the week. When they're lean, she rents them by the day. You're also going to hear that times were changing out on the road. Existence for Lee was getting to be very dangerous. The frequency with which she met physical abuse was escalating. Remember, she started on the roads when she was a young, young girl. <coughs> Things were changing. Time after time after time, she was raped. Time after time after time, she was beaten up and she wasn't paid. Finally, she armed herself. Jenkins begins planting the seed that her client acted in self-defense. Mr. Mallory opened the door, and he also opened a nightmare for Lee. This wasn't the nice, calm person. Again, he'd been smoking all night long and drinking, and, and Lee had been drinking also. But you will hear evidence of bondage, rape, soldering, and degradation. And Lee was a victim to that. Lee had a weapon in her purse on the floorboard, on the passenger side of the seat. Lee got that weapon, and she shot 
Mr. Mallory. She got out of the car. Mr. Mallory was still coming towards her. She said, don't come any closer. Don't come any closer or I'll shoot again. He was cursing at her. He was wounded. He was angry. And he said he was going to kill her. And he kept coming and she shot him again. It is a theme the defense will play up throughout the course of the trial, that Richard Mallory viciously attacked Eileen Werner, thus justifying her actions. But first, the prosecution will try discrediting that theory, calling its first witnesses. And later, the jury will decide when we return. Despite the media labeling Eileen Werner a serial killer, this is hardly an open and shut case for the prosecutor. There were no eyewitnesses to the killing of Richard Mallory, or for that matter, any of the other shootings. And although Warnus gave a very lengthy videotaped statement to police, admitting that she killed Mallory and the six other men, the statement could be interpreted as showing the men as the aggressors. The prosecution begins its case by calling a dozen witnesses, mostly state investigators, to testify about the Richard Mallory killing. Now that lays the groundwork for Warnus's statement, or as prosecutors call it, a confession, and the key witnesses that come later. On December the 13th, uh, we received a report that a body had been located in a wooded area uh, on US-1 north of I-95. Uh, when I arrived at the scene, uh, the deputy assigned to the zone had already arrived. Uh, cordoned off a, uh, a broad area to uh, secure the scene for further investigation. Uh, he was in the process. I observed him to be in the process of interviewing uh, the reporting party. I observed uh, a blanket uh, covering a uh, human body. There was a, uh, a hand exposed. What was the condition of the body when you first observed it after the rug had been removed on? Uh, which way was it facing in relation to the ground? It was laying uh, face down on the ground. We noted uh, that there were uh, gunshot wounds uh, on the upper part uh, of the body, uh, specifically involving the right arm, uh, the right side of the chest, uh, and the uh, left side of the chest. These were both on the front part uh, of the chest. In addition to the physical evidence, prosecutors also choose to introduce evidence about Warnus's motive, that she killed Richard Mallory for theft, not at all in self-defense. Prosecutor David DeMore calls a pawn shop employee. Do you want to know what the items are? Sure thing. Okay, there was a 35 millimeter camera, it was a Minolta Freedom 200, and the serial number is here, and how much I loaned her on it. And then there was a radar detector, a Micronta Road Patrol X, and the serial number is notated here and how much I loaned her on it. And then the total of what I loaned her. Do you indicate whether or not there is a Micronta, is a platoon colony, is a radar detector? It is a radar detector. And the name of the individual who pawned those items as was identified to you on December 6, 1989. Okay. Uh, as identified to me was Tammy Marsh Green. The thumbprint on pawn shop tickets bearing the name of Tammy Marsh Green, the ink fingerprint card bearing the name of Lori Christine Brody, and the ink fingerprints taken by myself of Eileen Warnos were all three of the same individual. To further dispel the self-defense theory, prosecutors contend Mallory was not in a position to attack Warnos because he was seated in a car when he was shot. The first hole in the back of the sleeve would be consistent with an entrance hole, which would mean that Marvel of the gun would have to be uh, aimed at the back side of the shirt here. The um, two shot holes, again, had gunpowder residue, so that the muzzle would have to be directed toward the hole in the front of the shirt. The collar, the outer surface of the collar, had the gunpowder residue, and again, the muzzle would have to be directed at. 
But Comar's testimony is inconclusive, and defense lawyer William Miller tries to imply that Mallory could have been attacking Warnos when she shot him. Mr. Kennedy just had you do a demonstration. Um, or actually had one of his assistants do a demonstration. He asked you to assume that the individual was sitting down as if they were some people talking. You, in fact, have no idea whether the individual is sitting in the front seat of a car, do you? That's correct. You cannot determine from your analysis whether or not that was the case. That's correct. You don't know whether he was standing, whether he was moving, or anything else, except that he was within six feet of the person who fired that weapon. That's correct. While the defense tries to hold its ground, the next witness on the stand is a key one for the prosecution. Hiram Moore was Warnus's former longtime live in girlfriend. Sam, would you tell us your full name, please? Tyra Dooley Moore. Moore was a suspect early on in the investigation, but then agreed to cooperate with prosecutors. How is it that you came to know her? I met her in a bar. And there's a telephone time in your life that uh, you and she spent together. Yes, we did. How long did that relationship last? About four and a half years. And can you describe the relationship uh, to us um, in regards to um, your living arrangements, um, your working arrangements, things of that nature? Well, we lived as lovers. And I, I worked quite a bit, and she worked as a prostitute. The questions turn to December 1st, 1989, the day of the killing. She told you that there was something that she wanted to tell you. Correct. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how that conversation began and what transpired? We were sitting on the floor watching TV, and she just came out and said, I have something to tell you. And I asked her what, and she said that she had shot and killed a man that day. Say anything to her when she told you? No, I didn't want really to believe it. I was probably in awe. Did you, did you say anything to her? Like, you know, I don't believe you, or what, you know, I don't want you to vulgarize me. I mean, you know, what's going on here? I'm what sure I saying? probably replied yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe I asked her any questions about it. I might have replied something like, I don't believe you, or something along that line. Did you say anything else at that point? She, yeah, later she was telling me that she had put the body in the woods under a piece of rug. I'm trying to understand what was happening in that apartment, in that garage, as you're being told by this defendant that she shot a man. Can you just describe that in your own words? We were just sitting around watching TV, drinking a few beers. It was a typical, you. typical evening. Moore's most important testimony, there was no evidence Warnos acted in self-defense. Could you, by looking at it, could you observe whether or not uh, she had been injured? No, I saw no sign of injury. In the morning when you left for work, in the first hour or in that evening? No. Was there anything abnormal about it? No. No. Before. How long did you remain living with the defendant after she told you she had shot this man on December the 1st, 1989? Approximately a year. At any time during the period of that relationship, as lovers, as roommates, as friends, did she ever advise you that the man she had shot had done anything to her? No, she didn't. Did she ever suggest that she had been raped by this man? I was second half and half to go. Did she ever say anything? No. Did she ever give you an explanation as to why she had shot the man? No. On cross-examination, the defense implies that Eileen Warnus confessed to police in order to protect Moore. Overall, Lee Werner was very protective of you, wasn't she? Yes. She loved you, didn't she? Yes. She said she'd do anything for you, didn't she? Yes, she did. And she said this to you on numerous occasions. Yes. She even said she died for you, didn't she, Tom? Yes. And she said that over and over again, didn't she? 
I'm sure he said it more than once. After Moore agreed to cooperate with the prosecutors, police put her up in a motel and had her telephone warn us to solicit incriminating information. The defense tries to paint Moore as a witness who would do or say just about anything to get herself off the hook. Well, you want Lee to say certain things? I definitely wanted Lee to say certain things. Yes, I did. You wanted Lee to make statements? Yes, right. I did. You wanted her to clear you, did you? Yes, I did. And in order for her to say what you wanted her to, you lied to her, right? Yes. You lied to her about why you came to Florida? Right. You lied to her about who you came with? Yes. You lied to her about who was paying for the room? Right. And more importantly, you lied to her about whether or not anybody was in the room with her? Yes, right. I did. And whether anybody was taking the conversation? Correct. Of course, the reason you did these things was to clear yourself. Yes, it was. And that's why, on two different occasions, you even suggested that you might kill yourself. So I don't understand your question, can you? Well, do you recall on two different occasions during these phone conversations suggesting that you might be suicidal over this whole thing? I remember once saying that, uh, why don't I just go kill myself? And the reason you did that was to get me to say the things you wanted to do, correct? I really don't know why I said it. You didn't want her to make statements to clear you. Yes, right. I did. And throughout all the conversations that she had with you, she continued to tell you how much she loved you, right? Yes, she did. And did she do anything for you, right? Yes. That she would even die for you. Yes. Yeah. Even though the defense tries to portray Moore as out for herself, her testimony hurts the defense case. Moore gives no indication that Eileen Warnos killed Richard Mallory in self-defense. Later, we'll see if the jury believes this self-defense argument. Stay tuned. So far, the prosecution has presented evidence that Warnos murdered just one person, Richard Mallory. But if Prosecutor John Tanner gets his way, the jury will hear about more than just that. We believe the other six murders clearly demonstrate a contrived plan by Eileen Warnos to lure men into uh, a prostitution situation, uh, uh, get them into uh, a circumstance in the woods where they relax, not expecting anything dangerous, and then take out her pistol, uh, shoot them, murder them, rob them, and uh, go on her way. This is what she's done in all seven cases, and we believe this shows a pattern of criminality and intent that is admissible and that should be admitted in the trial of this case. The alleged murder of the prosecutor is talking about are six additional killings, killings the prosecution says Warnus committed, but that the jurors have heard nothing at all about. Prosecutor John Tanner argues under the so-called Williams rule, those alleged murders should be allowed as evidence in this trial because they demonstrate a homicidal pattern of behavior. Well, that's an important victory for Tanner when the judge rules in his favor. Uh, we need to refer to it as a judge Blunt allows a series of witnesses to come forward and testify about the details of the other alleged murders. Can you tell the jury, please, that you have an opinion based upon uh, your experience as a forensic pathologist as the cause of death of Charles R. Humphrey? Yes. He died as a result of multiple gunshot wounds involving the head and torso. Did you have occasion to perform uh, another autopsy in connection with your duties uh, as a medical examiner? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the jury please the name of the deceased identified you in this second autopsy? David Spears. Dr. Pillow, uh, did you determine uh, for the deceased David Spears, who you autopsied on June the 4th, 1990, as the cause of death? Yes. Tell the jury, please, what your ultimate uh, opinion is with regard to the cause of death. Multiple gunshot wounds to the torso. Did there subsequently come a time when you made the discovery as to an individual that came known to you as Troy Burr? Yes, sir, that is correct. And what date did that occur? August 4th. Can you tell us how that discovery was made and where? There was a body located on, in the a wooded area on State Road 19, approximately 8 miles north of State Road 40 in our county. 
The body was lying face down. It had been covered with some palm fronds. Uh, it was in an advanced stage of decomposition that was discovered. This is a photograph taken in the autopsy room at my office of the abdomen, chest, head, and left arm region of the man that was ultimately identified as Car Charles Carscadden. The cause of death of Charles Carscadden was multiple gunshot wounds to the chest and abdomen. I observed uh, what appeared to be full bullet wounds to the uh, to the man. Um, three of them were to his back and one of them was to the base of the head. And from fingerprint comparisons, uh, he was identified as Walter Gino Antonio. All in all, 26 witnesses testified about four other alleged murders that Warnos has been charged with and two that she is suspected of committing. While there were no eyewitnesses to any of these killings, two alleged potential victims do testify. They came forward and told police that Warnos solicited them for sex. Did you come in contact with Ms. Warnos on or about November 5th, 1990? Yes. Yeah. She's here. Yes. Yeah. Could you describe to the jury the circumstances, how you first met her, and what occurred? Well, I was introduced to her as a lady with car trouble. Bobby Lee Copas, a truck driver, gives what could be incriminating testimony. Did you in fact give her a ride? Yes, I did. Then can you explain what occurred if anything as you gave her a ride? We started back up 27. And that's when she propositioned me. Can you tell the ladies down the what she said to them? That you can recall. She, she propositioned me and it kind of dumbfounded me for a minute because I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't expecting her to do that because up to that point, she's been a perfect, I mean, a perfect lady, I mean, about everything. And I thought she just a woman in distress. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I've been married 30 years to the same woman. I, I wasn't interested in nothing like that, so we drove along a little bit further. But when she propositioned me the third time, she wasn't the same person. She you described the jury what was occurring at this point. Uh, how was, how was he acting? Do I have to say the exact words? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, please. That's what I'm going to give you the best damn blood job you ever had in your life. And if the way that the tone of voice she said it in, and the way she said it, and we're going by all these arms, she, she made a statement with a clip up in the arms over there, and the wife would never move up and back. At this point in time, I was, I was, I was really scared, okay? I didn't know what to do. Did you see the gun? Had you seen the gun? I had already seen the gun. Copas explained how he escaped from Warner. If she, she got out of the car, if she did, I hit the electric door. You locked the door and I locked door. the door. That's when she realized she'd been tricked out of the car. And that's when she... Objection to the characterization of somebody else. Can you describe, that when you locked the door, did the defendant notice that you'd done that? Yes, yeah, he heard. He, he real loud, he heard. And what if anything happened then? If you'll describe what you were seeing at this time, what had happened? What I was seeing at that time was... The woman is total frustration, mad as hell, and she whirled around, and as she was coming around the, the car from my side, she said, I'll kill you like I did them other old fat son of a bitch. Now, did, old, now, did she have that purse with her? Yeah, she had the purse with her, but she was fumbling for it. She was coming out of the car, and I, all I was doing was thinking, how the hell to get out of it? I mean, just to get out of it. And as I was driving on, she, she hollered my tag number, my, which is my last name, my tag and the name of the thing. What did she say? She said, Copas, I'll get you, you son of a bitch. On cross-examination, defense attorney Tricia Jenkins tried to discredit Copas by putting Copas's story about Warnos in a different light. She, at some point, got out to make a telephone call. Is that correct? I tricked her into getting out to make a phone call, but I just, I just, I couldn't deal with her. I mean, she, she said she wanted to phone her sister, isn't that correct? She done right like that first up when we got in the car. She wouldn't call her sister. She wouldn't be in for that long. And you gave her some money to get out and call her sister. Isn't that true? That's after we done made the trip. Did you or did you not? I gave her five dollars to get out up there to call her sister and tell her we're coming all the way back on the beach. Okay. And That's when she got out of the car, you hit the door lock. Hit the door lock and locked her out. That's right. And that made her anger. Well, she was angry before that. You didn't take her all the way to Orlando, did you? Nope. I didn't need that problem. Did you call the police? 
Despite the defense attempts to discredit Copas, the prosecution hopes Copas left the jury with the impression of Warnus as threatening. The prosecution then shifts direction to the most important police investigator in the case, Larry Horzefa, a deputy sheriff in Volusia County, took the videotaped statement from Warner. Horzefa testifies four times. What follows is testimony from two points in the trial. He recalls what Warner said about Richard Mallory. Uh, Ms. Warner advised me that uh, she thought that she was going to be raped. Uh, she then stated that she jumped from the car. Uh, she grabbed her gun. Uh, there was a uh, uh, tussle for the uh, for the uh, actual bag itself, uh, pulling back and forth. She advises that she ends up with the bag and she has the gun. And she then orders uh, Mr. Mallory out of his car and says, uh, you son of a bitch, I knew you were going to rape me. Um, she bought, and Mr. Mallory responds by saying, no, I wasn't, no, I wasn't. Uh, Ms. Wernos, uh then shot Mr. Mallory at least one time as he was sitting behind the steering wheel with uh, one of those bullets striking Mr. Mallory in the right side of his body. Not sure what else she said. Did she say she gave him a chance to respond after he said, no, I wasn't, no, I wasn't? Uh, no, sir. She told me that she shot immediately. Did she say he was trying to get out of the car and chase her or anything like that? No, sir. On cross-examination, defense lawyer Billy Nolis challenges Orzepa, claiming he cut Warner short during her taped statement, not allowing her to explain fully how she acted to defend herself against Richard Mallory. She never asked her to explain what she meant by defending herself with Mallory, right? When she spoke about Mr. Mallory's homicide, she never gave me any specifics about what Mr. Mallory had done. She said, I was defending myself in this point. Yes, sir. Did you ever ask her, who were you defending yourself? No. Did you ever ask her, what did you mean by defending yourself? No, sir. Did you ever ask her, what were you defending yourself against? No, sir. As to each of the instances, Ms. Werner provided to you and Sergeant Munster what she perceived to be a situation in which she was defending herself or, or acting against some type of assault, right? Yes. There was not an instance where she said, no, with this guy, it was different, it was intentional, right? Yes. In fact, she told you she never intended to kill anyone, right? beginning of the statement. In reference to all of these though. Yes, sir. And she told you that she never intended to rob anyone, right? Yes, sir. She gave you examples of that. She told you she'd been with 200 some odd thousand men and nothing had happened with that other group of men, right? Yes, sir. She also told you that she never planned to go out and harm anyone on the road, right? That's true. She also told you that she never premeditated. She never mentioned premeditating anything, right? Okay. The prosecutor then introduces Warnus's taped statement. He plays 30 minutes of it for the jury. Here, Warnus describes the shooting. Okay, so let me get my heavy. No, I'm not going to get my heavy. Now, you get my heavy. Okay, I jumped out of the car with my bag. I 
That statement is one of the last impressions the prosecution leaves with the jury before resting its case. Now, even though the jury has not yet heard the defense, Prosecutor Tanner is confident. The verdict uh, uh, occasionally is, is not what I expect, but in this particular case, uh, the only evidence I heard, and it really wasn't evidence, was questioning by Mr. Nolis with regard to general statements of, uh, of self-defense. The actual confession, this woman indicated that the reason she was mad at Mr. Mowry's because he wouldn't take his pants off. And they got in an argument over whether he should take his pants off or not. And with that, she jumped out of the car and began to kill him. Uh, I don't believe a jury is going to accept that as self-defense. But the question remains, how will the defense play its hand? What's going to happen there? State has rested. In the morning, we'll come back and discuss jury instructions. The standard uh, motions will be uh, argued. And there will be a decision made as to whether or not we proceed. Jenkins won't say if the defense will call Eileen Warnus or any other witness to the stand. We'll find out. And later, the jury reaches its verdict when we come back. Tell me what you're doing. Are you sleeping? Oh, what? I am positive she did not do any premeditated murder. Positive. She is not a serial killer. The cops have dubbed her as a serial killer for their own book and movie deals. There's not a doubt in my mind she is no. Serial killer. Arlene Praley is Eileen Warnes' only loved one in court. Praley befriended her, then adopted her. I, I wrote her a letter and it said, I don't care if you're guilty or innocent. I just want to befriend you during this mess. And then the meanest part was, I said, Jesus himself told me to write to you. And she, when she got arrested, said, God, if you are real, send a Christian woman into my life to befriend me during this mess. So, you know, there it was. The relationship exploded from the time that she got my letter. Please state your full name for the record. Eileen Warnus. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, just if you can't hear me at any time, let me know. Okay. Fraley's hope rests with Eileen Warnus herself. The defense opens its case by calling Warnus to the stand. It's up to her to convince the jury she acted in self defense. Yeah. How old are you? 35. Uh, where are you from? Troy, Michigan. When did you leave home or come to Florida? Uh, around 14 years old. Okay. Where had you been living just prior to being 14 years old you decided to come to Florida? I was living in Troy, Michigan. Okay. With your family? Yes. Uh, why did you come to Florida? Because when I was younger and I was living out in the streets, I was sleeping in the snow and all. It was too cold, and I had to come to Florida where it was warmer weather and seek warmer shelter. Okay. How did you come to Florida? I hitchhiked. And did you come with a friend, or how did you come? By myself. How did you support yourself during those early years? Well, I had a couple jobs for 75 cents an hour, but I basically was a prostitute. Okay. Well, when did you start becoming a prostitute? Like? At the age of 16. When you were younger, just starting out, were you ever physically hurt while you were out on the road? And if you were, again, tell us where you were and how old you were. Okay, I was heard a couple of times. Um, there was this guy in Jefferson's arm, Diana, who was a third degree karate and judo, and judo instructor and a school, seventh grade school teacher. And I met him in a lounge and um, he beat me up so bad I, you couldn't describe my face. Why did you quit walking the road that has been hurt? Because it was my only way I could, well, see, like, I tried to get churches to help me, and they told me I had to be part of the congregation, and they wouldn't help me. When I tried to be a police officer when I was 20 years old. They told me I had to have $3,000 for tuition, and um, that, uh, then they'd send me to some academy or something like that. I, had, I didn't have my GED. Then I tried to be a correctional officer here in Daytona, and they told me I had to have a car. I didn't have a car. I only had a bicycle. Um... 
Then I tried the Salvation Army. They told me I can only crash at their place for one day out of every 364 years. You can only stay one night. And I tried and tried and tried to help myself. I joined. I took the aptitude berry test for the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines. And I missed by three to five points every time. And I thought that would help me get off the road by just going into the government military field. And I didn't pass. That took me two years because you got to wait six months every time to take the aptitude battery test. And so the only thing I, had, I could do was be a prostitute and live off of... Yeah. I lived here and there and everywhere. Warnes' testimony shifts focus to her meeting Richard Mallory. And as I started to walk, a vehicle pulled over before I get, got past the bridge. And then it started, it lights came on, it started backing toward me, and it, I didn't know if it was a bunch of guys in the car or what, but anyway, a car, a vehicle passed, and its headlights went on in the vehicle, and I saw one head, so I felt, all right, walked up to the car, and I opened the door, and I said, did, did you stop for me? And he said, yeah. Uh, are you going to Orlando? I said, no, I'm going to Daytona. He said, oh, wow, you're a lucky day, man, because I'm going all the way to Daytona. I said, oh, wow, this is great. So I got in the car. He asked me, you know, where I was going to tell him Daytona. I was real glad and everything. We started down the road. He asked me if I wanted to drink. He, he had some kind of, I didn't know what it was. I just saw to tonic bottles, and then I thought it said Smirnoff. I'm not sure. And he asked me if I wanted to drink. And um, and then I asked him, I said, well, what is it? And he says, vodka. So I said, Oh, right. And I think he had orange juice. And I said, sure, I'll take a drink, you know. So he made, he pulled over and he made me a drink. And then we started back on the road. And then he asked me if I wanted to smoke some marijuana. I said, no. I, my hands swell, my feet swell, my heart beats a mile a minute. I can't stand it, but, if, you know, if you smoke it, that's your business. And he said, well, then you don't mind. I said, it's your car. I don't care what you do. Warnos described her discussion with Mallory leading up to the shooting. Then he said, well, I got an idea. How about if, if we both do this now, we both get undressed, so I know that you won't skip out on my money. And I said, well, Richard, you know, I've never rolled a client in my life. I've never skipped out on anybody, but I can understand, I think, saying because I told you I use rubber, and I ain't going to do it without any rubber for anybody. I don't care. No exception to the and I'm precautious, so I guess we'll be in precautious too. So, okay, that sounds fine to me. And he said, what if I don't, told you I don't have enough money? And like, I'm telling you, I don't really care. I was just doing this for a little, I was really just doing this for half time, but I wasn't going to do it for free. I got to definitely have to make something out of it because I've got somebody at home I can get my sex from if I need it. And I mean, you know what I'm saying. Okay. So, anyways, I said, how much do you have you got? And he said, I've only got a little for breakfast and some for gas. And I said, Richard, I said, no way. I said, I'm not here for my health. I said, we made an agreement. And I'm sorry, but I guess we're going to have to just call this off. You know, because he's acting like he don't have any money. So I turned around and I had my clothes on top of some boxes or something that were in the back, something there, I can't remember exactly, but they were on something. And I started to grab them, and as I started to grab my clothes, I saw him coming toward me. And, and I was going to turn to look at him, and before I even got a chance to turn and look at him, he ripped, ripped the cord around my neck. Here, Warnes' testimony becomes crucial to her claim of self-defense. He testifies that Mallory brutalized her, something she did not say in her videotaped statement to police. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm really nervous, and I'm really getting pretty shy and embarrassed, and this is hard for me, so just bear with me. Um, he put the cord around my neck and he said, yes, you are a bitch. He said, you're going to do everything I tell you to do. And if you don't, I'll kill you right now. And I'll see you after, like, just like the other sluts I've done. And um, 
and he said, it doesn't matter to me, your body, your body will still be warm. He so, walked around from the driver's seat to the passenger side and opened the door and started to undress and joined clothes on the floor. And this is very embarrassing for me. So he got in and then he told, lifted my legs all the way up and my feet are near the window. Then he was he began to start having uh animal sex. doing this very violent manner movement and then he I don't know if he came or nothing climax I, stro- I talk street talk so, so I don't know if he did that <clears throat> and he violently took himself out and and put himself in my vagina I said to myself, I think this guy is going to kill me. He's going to get rid of me. Or he, I don't know what he's going to do. He's dissect me or something. I don't know what he's got in his bag. Like, he's strange. He is totally weird. Warno said Mallory then approached her in the car. And he said, this is one of my surprises. Oh, Lord, my ears are ringing. And I'm dizzy a little. Put it down for a second with your mic. Hmm. Okay. Alright, so, uh, takes the vice and, and he lifts up my leg and he puts what turns out to be rubbing alcohol in the bison bottle and he sticks some of my rectum area <laughs> and that really hurt but he said because he tore me up for a while and he put some in my vagina which really hurt that. And then he walked around, back to driver's seat side, and he pulled my nose open like this. Pulled them open, and he squirted rubbing alcohol down my nose. Then he said, I'm saving your eyes for the grand finale, and he put the visine back on the dash. And I was really pissed. Then, oh. Uh, he, I grabbed it from it. Yeah, he takes his left arm, he's choking me, and I grabbed my, he just, I can't, he just grabbed me like this, and I grabbed my hand up like this, and kept it away. He slapped me really hard in the face, and I, and he started choking me, but I grabbed his right, the left arm, right arm, right arm, yes, and I kept it up, and I hit, got upward with my feet, and I pushed him back and he kind of quit struggling and just got up on his knees and he said, you're going to be a lot of fun. Why are you saying that? <clears throat> I jumped up real fast and I spit in his face. And he said, you're a dead bitch. You're dead. He's wiping his eyes. And I laid down real quick and grabbed my bag. And he was starting to come for, for me when I grabbed my bag and then whipped my pistol out toward him. And he was coming toward me with his right arm, I believe. And I shot immediately. And I think I shot twice, as fast as I could. And I went to do. And he started coming at me again. And I shot. He stopped. I heard, kind of pushed him away from me. And he kind of sat up on the driver's seat. I hurried 
opened the passenger door, ran around the driver's side, opened the door real fast, looked at him, and he started to come out. And I said, don't come out. Don't come near me. I'll shoot. I'll have to shoot you again or something like that. Don't make me have to shoot you again or something like that. He just started coming at me, and I shot. And I don't know where I shot him. I just shot him. And he fell on the ground. By taking the witness stand, Eileen Warnos has allowed the jury to hear about her troubled life. But her testimony presents problems for the defense. She told the jury a very different story than she told police in her taped statement. And this could emerge as a key to how the jury comes to its verdict. Coming up. Eileen Warnos has been on the stand under direct questioning by her lawyer for an hour. But on cross-examination, prosecutor John Tanner knows he must discredit Warnus' story. He must convince the jury she did not act in self-defense. Mr. Warnus, you were in the courtroom yesterday on the uh, videotape of the statement about Richard Mallory who played what? Yes, sir. You saw it in this entirety, didn't you? Yes. You didn't make one mention of an anal rape or being tied up or having alcohol supported in your... Uh, rectum did during that statement. I told you that he was getting violent, and also I told you before in the first confession that he was talking about anal screwing. Did you, in fact, see anywhere in that video tape where you tell uh, that Detective Corzeppa at any time that you were strangled with cord by Mr. Mountain? Well, Every time I tried to start telling you or him about what was happening, he'd interrupt me and ask me how, time, how many times was this person shot, um, what kind of items did he take, did he say anything after he was, when he shot him, where did you leave his car? I never got a chance to ever express myself. Before. Detective Forsyth began the interview with. You said he wanted to tell him all of the facts and circumstances surrounding Mallory's killing, didn't he? I don't remember recalling him saying that. You don't recall him saying that? No. Well, what did you think your purpose was when you were sitting there telling him about the Mallory case? My main purpose was there to confess about Tyra's innocence, and that was all. I didn't have any. I I couldn't. There was no way that I could have even. Remember, I was hysterical, a shock, and they had forced me to talk saying they're going to arrest Tyra Moore if I don't ask, answer their questions on the case, because I didn't want, I was only there to confess about Tyra's innocence, because I just got done talking to her on the phone and told her I was going to confess to clear her. Now, I only cleared her because I loved her. All right, what is it that Tyra Moore knows that you're not? And wanted to protect her. What is it that Tyra Moore knows that you're not talking about? Objection to the part of the question, Ryan. She believes it, it. She knows that it's self-defense, and she is not telling anybody anything. When questioned by her own lawyer, Warnus had said she carried a handgun for protection. But the prosecutor attacks her for this because she has a prior felony conviction for armed robbery. Do you know it's against the law to carry a concealed firearm gun? Yes. And but I took that risk because I had to use protection. <coughs> And also, if I, if I wasn't a convicted felon, I would have bought a gun and carried it. But since the law won't let us felons once we get out of prison protect ourselves with a weapon, they just say, go ahead and get killed. We don't care. We have to just go but, uh, forget the law and carry it anyway. Because there's a lot of people that have been going convicted felons coming out of prison and there are just as decent people as can be, yet you say we can't carry a weapon. We've got to protect ourselves. There has to be a way to protect ourselves. So we can't you, use our hands. You're even a victim of the law. Objection, Your Honor. You're even a victim of the law. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you just said because of the law. Oh. Right. We can't use our hands. That's what I'm saying. We have to have a weapon. Were you trying to tell us that us convicted... Felons cannot defend ourselves? 
Yeah. We have to have a, re- a way to defend ourselves. We think that all convicted felons are allowed to carry guns. Objection, Your Honor. Well. Ooh. Is that what you said? Say what you, I didn't hear what you said. So you think that convicted felons should be allowed to carry a gun? Yes, a lot of them did turn into the Lord, and a lot of them are very decent people, and very straight, forward people. Once, so they broke the law, everybody breaks the law, and I bet you do too. And in fact, you drive a car and pollute the earth. And some of them shoot men to death in cold blood, don't they? Objection, Your Honor. Oh, some of them shoot men to death in cold blood, don't they? No, they don't. I didn't shoot anybody in cold blood. Prosecutor John Tanner then turns to the confrontation between Werner and Richard Mallory. You shot him immediately, didn't you? You can't say anything, did you? Am I supposed to stop the clock and say, rationalize with this guy who's about, who wanted to kill me? He said him. he was going to kill me? You didn't give him a chance to say anything when you shot him the first time, did you? No, I didn't. What about the second time? Nope. What about the third time? No. Nope. What about the last time you shot him on the ground? I didn't shoot him on the ground. I shoot him. I shot. I shot him as he was coming out of the car, and I shot him. I told him to stop. Don't move no more. Don't come toward me anymore. And just stay there. He didn't listen. He was coming out of the car, and I shot him again because I didn't know what the dickens he was doing. I didn't know if he had another gun under the seat. I didn't know if he was going to reach for another weapon. I don't know what he had. And there was. He didn't have a weapon in that car, did he? How do I know? Did he have a weapon in that car? No, he didn't. When you shot Mr. Mallory, you intended to kill him, didn't you? I didn't watch him. I had no choice. You intended to kill him, didn't you? I had no choice. I didn't. I couldn't stop the clock and say, "Well, let's see where I can shoot him at so he'll stay alive." I, there, I had to immediately shoot. He was going to kill me. He was, in, he was going to beat the living daylights out. He choked me to death. Whatever he was going to do. You've explained that several times. Just answer the question. You intended to kill him, didn't you? Uh, I say no. Well, and here's your answer. No. You shot him in the chest? I had no choice. Wherever I shot him and it killed him, I had no choice. I didn't have a chance to stop the clock and say, shoot him in the leg, shoot him in the foot, shoot him in the arm. And I'm not the greatest aimer. I did whatever I had to do at the quickest moment and out as fast as possible. You say that here you are, the woman who is ravaged and naked, right? Right? Yes, I was naked. Cord marks around her neck where she's been strangled. Right? Right? Yes. Bleeding from the anus where you've been raped. Right? Yes. Alcohol and visine bottles where this torture took place. Right? There's alcohol drinks on, in, on the hook. Well, the alcohol is squirted up your anus. Oh, yes. A cord with which you had been tied to the wheel and held by the deck. Mm-hmm. Yes. And no one would believe that you'd been assaulted? The, the marks on my neck were very small. They looked like they Well, how about your anus? You said it was bleeding. It was ripped. It's the way I was. I was. I was too, I'm not supposed to walk out there nude with a gun in my hand down the road say somebody help me. No way, I was totally, and with a gun in my hand, I, I couldn't stop the clock and rationalize out anything. So you decided to kill him? I decided to shoot him in self-defense. Everybody has the right to defend themselves and learn on a suicidal mission. And you never even bothered to tell your best friend to tell the news of the murder until the news of the murder came up on television. Yes, I did. Did you tell him about the news of the murder? Yes, I did. Did you tell him about the news of the murder? Yes, I did. Did you tell him about the news of the murder? Warnus is the only defense witness to testify. Whether or not the jury believes her is the key to this trial. If she was able to cast doubt on the state's version of events, then it could save her from the death penalty.
but it was risky to take the witness stand. And Arlene Praley says it was Warnus's decision. When did she make the decision to take the stand? Probably 11 months ago. It's something she's wanted to do forever, and none of us were able to talk her out of it. So I just thought, well, okay, I'm behind you in this. You know, just tell the truth and be as calm as you possibly can be. So all things considered, I think she did well. Did her attorneys push hard to try her to get her not to take the stand? We all pushed hard to get her not to take the stand just because she's so shy and she gets so easily flustered and frightened. We didn't think she would be able to handle it, but she did good. The attorneys will make their closing argument, and then the jury will decide if Eileen Warnos is guilty of first-degree murder when we return. After seven days of testimony from 42 witnesses, it's now time for the jury to hear closing arguments from the lawyer. Defense attorney William Miller is first. Richard Mallory was shot in late 1989. Lee Warnos had been prosecuted for some 17 years prior to that day. And while she'd been late and beaten before, it wasn't until a drunken stone, Richard Mallory, hurtly, degradedly, and ultimately tortured her, she really took the action that she did. It was only as she lay naked in a strange car in a dark, secluded place after having undergone unbearable torture that she finally took a life to defend herself. You don't know people what such an experience did to leave mine or whether she could ever be the same again. You do know, however, that she continued to be a prostitute the only work that she knew. And she continued to bring money to Tyler Moore. And she continued to go out on the road at least three times a week, several men on each of those days. <clears throat> and you know, therefore, that Lee Warner had sex with dozens of men in the next six months that followed. And you also know from the testimony that there were no incidents. And you also know that something happened again when she met David Spears in the year of 1990. Maybe something snapped in really after that. Maybe she simply couldn't respond to anything normally she did. Those difficult questions are not for you to decide. Those difficult questions are for other jurors and other judges. Your job is much simpler because the evidence in this case is much clearer. Far from being the creditor, Mr. Tanner described in the judgment state, Lee Warnes was the victim. She was the victim of a brutal attack, a torturous attack at the hands of Richard Mallory in December of 1989. Prosecutor John Tanner then gives his closing argument to the jury. In our opening, I told you that on November the 30th, 1989, 51-year-old Richard Mallory turned east on the I-4. He didn't know that he was living the last 10 hours of his life. He didn't know that in less than 10 hours he robbed and left to rock the woods. Of course, he didn't know he was about to pick up this one. Nor did he know that for whatever reason, she had begun to change her course of conduct, as far as we know, to a lethal and deadly pattern that would be reenacted over the next year seven times. Her appetite to control men, and that's what most prostitutes are about, size, money, and control. That's tremendous control. Take all the main hands. Run our section to I'm ready to down with her. I can put the water to the To take all the main hands. Physically. Some say spiritually. There's tremendous and almost absolute control. There's only one thing left. There's only one thing left, and that's to kill. 
He told to tell it all. He told you not to tell everything. Never said that Mr. Mallard raped her. Certainly never said that he tied her to the steering wheel. In fact, I recall I asked her about this anal rape thing. She said, no, no, that's a different one. That's a different man. Different one. Doesn't count. This is a murder out of greed. This is a woman who makes, according to her own testimony, on her high figure, thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year, and squander it just as quickly. This is a woman moving out of power and control into a new, a new and unfathomable for you and I area of domination to the extent of snuffing out life. It became obscenely simple to have it all. Is there any answer to the why? How did this happen? Not to this jury, not to this time, and not for us. She chose her life. She chose the time and place. And she has left you no reasonable choice. No reasonable choice under the evidence of this case. Except to find her guilty of murder in the first degree. Now I'm wrong. Thank you. Defense attorney William Miller has just one last chance to address the jury. He implies that Richard Mallory got what he deserved. That is, she had every right to shoot Mr. Mallory. She had every right to shoot him not once, not twice, not three, but four times. She was terrified. She was drunk. She was naked. She was tortured. And she defended herself. That's not a crime. Tanner also got up here and he spoke to you about the fact that Eileen Wernus is a prostitute. Eileen Wernus asked to be a prostitute. Well, did Eileen Wernus ask to be slapped? Did she ask to be tied to the steering wheel? Did she ask to be anally assaulted? Each and every one of you in jury selection indicated that you could be fair. Each and every one of you indicated that a prostitute, yes, a prostitute can be raped. Mr. Tanner suggests to you that somehow she brought this all on herself because of her profession. She was raped, and she was brutalized. And despite her profession, she had a right to defend herself. The defendant in this case is accused of the following crime. Before the jury begins its deliberations, Judge Blunt instructs the jury on the law to be applied in this case. Before you can find the defendant guilty of first degree premeditated murder in charge of count one of the indictment, the state must prove the following three elements beyond the reasonable doubt. One, that Richard Mallory is dead. Two, that the death was caused by the criminal act of agency of Eileen Warren. And three, there was a premeditated killing of Richard Mallory. An issue in this case is whether the defendant Eileen Warren acted in self-defense. The use of force might be caused to have the great body of harm is justifiable only if the defendant reasonably believes that the force is necessary to prevent him or death or great body of harm to herself while resisting another attempt to murder her or a victim to a sexual battery, aggravated battery, or aggravated assault on her. It is now up to the jury to determine if Warnus is guilty of first-degree murder or if he acted out of self-defense in shooting Richard Mallory to death. If convicted of first-degree murder, Eileen Warnos faces a death sentence. The wait for Warnus is short. The jury deliberated only 91 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, the 
seven, I can start to make you a lot of great, that's correct. Okay. The break from the form and the court for inspection from form. The judge asked the clerk to read the verdict. Okay. Okay. Warnus was outraged by the guilty verdict and let the jury hear about it. With Warnus's guilt decided, the jury now must recommend whether Warnus should live or die. That decision comes. <laughs> Only the day before, Eileen Warnus was convicted of first-degree murder. Now her life hangs in the balance. The jury will hear evidence from the prosecution and the defense in what is known as the sentencing phase of this trial, and from it. The jury will give a recommendation to the judge, either life in prison or the death penalty. Judge Blunt explains the procedure to the jury. The state and the defendant may now present evidence relative to the nature of the crime and the character of the defendant. You are instructed that this evidence, when you consider with the evidence that you have already heard, is presented in order that you may determine, first, whether sufficient aggravating circumstances exist that would justify the imposition of death penalty, and second, whether these mitigating circumstances are sufficient to outweigh the aggravating circumstances, if any. That explanation is perhaps his most important in the trial. The jury will hear testimony about so-called aggravating and mitigating factors. It must balance the two and then determine if there is sufficient evidence to warrant a death sentence. Prosecutor John Tanner gives a brief opening statement. Most of the aggravating factors that we would present have already been proven in the trial. Tanner explains that these aggravating factors include committing a premeditated murder while also stealing. This particular conviction, verdict number three, which your verdict uh, confirmed and, and in fact was the final arbiter last night, that it was committed while in the act of carrying out a robbery. Of course, your verdict confirms that, uh, confirms that already, or you made that decision. You may give such weight as you see to each aggravating factor, or such weight as you see, or lack of weight, to each mitigating factor. And if even one aggravating factor would, in your opinion, majority of you justify the imposition of death sentence, and that is sufficient. We believe that the evidence that we will present over the next day and a half will convince you that the sentence that is appropriate in this case, the sentence that we do justice, and the sentence which is justified by the evidence, the sentence that I mean one of they with her life for the crime she committed murder in murder knowledge. Thank you. So the defense, Eileen Warnos' mental condition at the time of the murder is the key mitigating factor. The defense says Warnos does not deserve to die because when she killed Richard Mallory, she suffered from an extreme mental condition. You've heard two weeks of state's evidence regarding Ms. Warnos' guilt. You've seen we were testified on the stand. 
you saw her cross examination. You observed her behavior. You've seen her here in court. And some of you must have observed her behavior here in court during the course of the last two weeks. And I dare say that many of you must have been thinking to yourselves, why? Why is it? Why is she the way she is? This is the part of the case where you get answers to the question of why. We were did not simply fall from the sky. Her biological father, the evidence that you will hear, will indicate to you, was the person who hanged himself in a penitentiary, for he had been convicted of kidnapping. The biological mother abandoned her before she saw her first birthday. From the time she was a little kid, six, seven, eight years old, her school records consistently reflected, this is a person who is in care. This is a person who is not well. This is a person who needs help. She never got that. But we were great when she was 14 years old. And I know that's a word that's been used during the last two weeks. She was sexually abused and raped by a gentleman in the 40s. And she became pregnant. And she was so terrified of what her family would think of her that she tried to hide the pregnancy. And eventually nature took its course and the pregnancy could not be hidden. And her grandfather found out. And he was ashamed. And he sent her to an unwed mother's home. And there she had the child, the child she never knew. The child was taken away from her. You will hear evidence about Lee's inheritance, about what the genetic and the biological factors, and about what this environment has done to Lee. You will hear about why she is sitting before you today with this demeanor when you will be deciding whether she lives or die. To bolster its case that Eileen Warnos does not deserve to die, the defense calls Dr. Elizabeth McMahon to examine Eileen Warnos before trial. I would diagnose Ms. Warnos as what's called a borderline personality disorder. Um, by that I mean an individual who uh, engages in intense and unstable in personal relationships who is very labile in their emotions, by that I mean roller coaster. Uh, one minute happy, one minute sad, one minute angry, one minute laughing, one minute just very rapid uh, change of, of emotion. Who is impulsive, um, who is, has a great deal of trouble with intense anger and not being able to modulate that well, uh, who may engage in self-destructive behavior, either very overtly in terms of suicidal attempts or more subtly in terms of lifestyle. Well, this is probably one of the most primitive people I've seen outside of an institution. By that I mean that she functions at the level of very basic. By basic, I mean small child needs. We're talking about food and shelter and clothing and an attempt at some sense of security. Dr. McMahon testifies that one of his perception at the time of the killing is key, and that one of his perception was that her life was in danger. The question of whether that was right or wrong becomes irrelevant, as it does would with any one of us. It becomes irrelevant at the moment at which we're confronted with what, in my clinical opinion, Ms. Wernos believes was a life-threatening situation. At that point, we don't stop, put everything on freeze hold, and try and figure out whether what we're about to do is legal, illegal, anything else. We simply react. She is going to react more quickly, with less thought, than the average individual, given her impairment, anyway. But on cross-examination, Prosecutor David Damore tries to diffuse any suggestion that Warnos' mental state excused her behavior. Dr. McMahon, tell us in your expert opinion whether or not the defendant is legally insane. My clinical opinion, she is not. Tell us in your clinical opinion whether or not the defendant knows the difference between right and wrong. In my clinical opinion, in most instances, 
Yes. So if I understand your testimony, if the defendant feels threatened, she reacts. Yes. And whether or not her perception of that is the reality or the truth of what is actually happening is based on her perception, and that excuses her actions in your mind. That's the question, Your Honor. Well, Doctor, does it, does it matter what really happened, or does it matter what she tells you happened? Both. Well, doctor, if Lee Warner had been anally raped and sexually abused by Richard Mallory, and she was really defending herself, you wouldn't need to have any type of dysfunction of the mind to call that self defense, would you? Oh, Judge, okay. Man, you, sure. you have no idea what happened out there between she and Richard Mallory based upon what she told you not to do. Objection, that's the answer. While the defense calls two other psychologists to bolster this case, the prosecution calls its own witness to counter the defense. Dr. George Barnard agrees with defense experts that Eileen Wernos suffers from a personality disorder, but he says it should not qualify as a mitigating factor in determining if Wernos deserves the death sentence. In your medical opinion, was it committed while she was under the influence of an extreme mental or emotional disturbance? No. And with regard to the killing of Richard Mallory by Eileen Warner, did she have the capacity to appreciate the criminality of her conduct? She did. And did she have the capacity to conform her conduct to the requirements of the law? <coughs> And her personality, borderline personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder did not impair her to take away those abilities, did it? Not to the extreme or significant degree. Okay. No further questions, John. Thank you. Doctor, just to clarify, in your report, you indicated that I didn't want to did have an emotional and or mental disorder at the time of the offense. Okay. And in your report, you indicated that I didn't want to did have an impaired capacity to conform the Congress to the requirements of the law at the time of the offense. Okay. You're saying that <laughs> had an impairment to conform to the requirements of law, but not a substantial impairment. <coughs> it's a non-statutory mitigating circumstance. Yes. You're saying that she had an emotional or mental disturbance, but not an extreme one. Right. So Dr. Barnard acknowledges that Warnos has severe emotional problems, but he implies they are not severe enough to justify not giving her a death sentence. And the prosecution then calls its very last witness, the only relative of Eileen Warner, to testify. Sir, would you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes, I'm uh, Barry Warner. In death penalty cases, family members of the defendant often take the witness stand. They plead for the life of their loved one. That is not the case here. Barry Warner takes the witness stand for the prosecution to contradict the defense claim that Warnos grew up in a dysfunctional, abusive family. Eileen Warnos was raised by her grandparents, Barry Warnos' parents. We were a pretty, uh, pretty straight, straight and narrow family. Um, very little trouble in the family. While Eileen was growing up, uh, very little trouble from the day we picked her up at, I would say she was around two years old to about 10 or 11 when uh, I left for the service. And uh, about all I can say was uh, just a normal upbringing for all of us. Can you tell us some things about your father, what kind of a man was um, uh, uh, Well, he was, it was kind of a disciplinarian. When it came, are you speaking to discipline or upbringing? Well, what was your impression of your father? Oh, he was up at the top. Well, he's very, a man of very strong character. Uh, Gentleman, he had a he was laid down strong rules, but uh, a man you could really look up to. Is the kind of man that would beat a child? Oh, absolutely not. But he confirms that problems began developing in one of his life at an early age. He reached about the age of uh, nine, ten, and eleven. About the time I went into the service, things began to get a little tight with Eileen, discipline-wise. 
Uh, she began, uh, well, the ice, tip of the iceberg there is when she, uh, got shot for shoplifting. She left the toy with fire a little bit and got badly burnt once, but, uh, the only disciplines that were ever put down were uh, ground. And, uh, no thinking that I ever saw Eileen in that, although in my day, I kind of see myself. But on cross-examination, defense attorney Billy Nolis gets Barry Warnus to acknowledge that Eileen Warnus' father is a criminal. I remember a few incidents, uh, uh, as he was trying to gate Diane, and he was quite a wealthy individual, and, uh, he used to tear up and down the street and hang around with quite, uh, the hoods in the neighborhood. And he was, uh, pretty abusive. One day he, uh, threw me down and threatened to choke me if I wouldn't give a message to Diane, and, uh, he was generally a criminal type, you know. Do you know how he died? Yes, I do. How did he die? I heard he, uh, he was sent to prison and later hung himself. Barry Warnus' testimony then turns to the man who raised Eileen Warnus, her grandfather. Did your dad bring him? Yes, he did. Did he drink often? I would say he had, uh, left probably one bottle of wine a day. Never more, and hardly, well, I won't say less, because he had periods where two or three times in my lifetime where he tried to dry out completely, and he did for like a year at a time. But he would complain, uh, he had bad pains in his legs from the war, he had some war wounds, and he uh, always claimed that the wine was the only thing that could ease that pain. So, but it never affected his work record or anything. Barry Warnus gave a very mixed impression of Eileen Warnus' childhood. While he helped confirm for the defense that Eileen Warnus came from a troubled family, he also established for the prosecution that her family life appeared more normal than the defense had presented. When we come back, the jury decides for life or death. Coming up next. It is day 11 of the trial. The jury has already found Eileen Warnos guilty of murder, and now it must decide whether to recommend to the judge that she die for her crime. First, Prosecutor John Tanner presents his final argument in the penalty phase. It came out seemingly simple for Eileen Warnos' guilt. At one moment, Richard Mallory appears. And a few minutes later, by an act of her will, he was no more. It's not that he never existed. It's not that he never breathed and lived and hoped. It's simply that he was no more. By an act of her will, in just 15 to 20 minutes, she extinguished the man's life forever. I want to observe the ultimate penalty provided under the law of the state of law. Thank you. Defense lawyer Tricia Jenkins then gives an impassioned plea for Eileen Warnos' life. Ladies and gentlemen, this is perhaps one of the most difficult tasks I've ever been required to do. I must ask you to say, Eileen Warnos, how do I explain, how do any of us explain what it's like the sea things as we do. She carried with her the baggage of abandonment, the forfeiture of a child, of a baby when she was still just a child. She carried with her the inability to figure out how to make it, how to do anything at all to satisfy for basic needs. Jenkins says life in prison is punishment enough. Every second of every minute 
of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, Lee will be confined. Someone else will tell her when to go to bed and when to get up. Someone else will tell her when and what she can eat. Someone else will tell her what she can read. When she longs for the comfort of human touch, she can't have it. Even if you are merciful, you will simply be giving her the mere right to exist. Please go back there. Please go back and decide that that is punishment enough. Thank you. Thank you, John. Eileen Warnes' fate now rests in the hands of the jury. And if that jury finds that aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors, they must recommend that Eileen Warnos be executed in Florida's electric chair. The jury's decision need not be unanimous. Only seven votes are required. <laughs> It turns out to be a short wait. In just under two hours, the jury announces it has a decision. It was an emotional moment for the jurors. They recommended unanimously that Eileen Warnos die for killing Richard Mallory. Now, Judge Blunt must make the final decision beyond or against Eileen Warnos. Are you guys preparing for a death sentence tomorrow? I mean, in light of the, the unanimous message? Yes, and in light of what we understand uh, is uh, Judge Blunt's practice, that he does not override. Five times in his career, a jury recommended the death sentence to Judge Blunt. And each time, Judge Blunt followed its recommendation. But Blunt, a veteran of 25 years on the bench, says his mind in this case is not made up. I'm, I'm having to look at uh, 10 days of testimony, 12 days of testimony, what have we heard in the trial and two days in the uh, sentencing hearing to establish the aggravating circumstances and the mitigating circumstances to determine if uh, the aggravating had been established uh, beyond a reasonable doubt and further to determine if a doubt does exist, uh, then of course the mitigating circumstances prevail. I have the evidence in the library with me at this very time and I am going through it item by item and reviewing it to make a decision. You have not made it tomorrow yet? I probably won't have it made until 9.29 tomorrow morning. The next morning, Eileen Warner and her primary supporter have a chance to make a final plea. Your Honor, um, my husband and I adopted Eileen Warner on November the 6th. Um, we heard in the courtroom three expert witnesses in the field of psychology who said that I knew one of the 35 years physically was emotionally and psychologically a child. There are two factors I think that are very important. Her school records indicated, as well as the experts, that um, I knew one from a very young age wanted the structure of a very tight family. She longed to have that in her training environment. And the school records also indicated that she was in need immediately of counseling, immediate. Those were never granted. Both of those factors are now present this day in 1992. She has a family that cares about her, that loves her unconditionally. And we are offering, Your Honor, if you would give mercy in this case, we are willing to pay for the professional counseling that anyone should have received as a child. 
Eileen Warner then addresses the judge. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say that I have been labeled a serial killer, and I am no serial killer. I've been framed by the law enforcement as a serial killer because of numerous men involved. But what I was was a prostitute. And in my prostitution, I happened to deal with a lot of men, at least 200, 250 men a month. And I ran into these men along the way in my prostitution. I do not feel, I was not out there to hurt anyone. I didn't, had no intentions of hurting anyone. In my confessions, I stated that nine times. I stated 37 times self-defense, 39 times that they raped or beat to, and then begin to rape or, and it had intentions of killing. And what I did was what anybody else would do. I defended myself. I believe State Canada, State Attorney Canada was the one manipulating the jury, which he had made a whole lot of things up. They were just things that were made up at the top of his head, were not true, and I felt that he lied right through his teeth. I was up in that stand there, and I did not lie. I was coerced in take, making my confession. I was threatened that Tyra Moore would be arrested if I did not talk about the confession. I was also forced and threatened and told that if I did not answer their questions the way they wanted me, I mean their questions, and I did it any other way, that she would be arrested. And the questions that they asked me were strictly to implicate me as a serial killer when every time I talked about a rape, they cut me off. And they had my mind all messed up where I was hysterical, I was in trauma, and I was alcohol withdrawing. I have been totally under duress and delirium, and I didn't, I couldn't tell you what happened anyway. I couldn't remember anything. All I got to say, I'm not a serious Judge Blunt then delivers his sentence. As to count one, the defendant Carol Warner being now before the court attended by her attorneys, Tricia Jenkins, William Miller, and Billy Nolas, and having been adjudicated guilty of the crime of first degree premeditated murder and first degree felony murder, a capital felony, it is against the law and the judge of this court that you, Eileen Carol Warner, be delivered by the sheriff of Volusia County, Florida, with a copy of this court court with the proper officers of the Department of Corrections of the state of Florida and by him safely kept until by warrant of the governor of the state of Florida, you, Eileen Carroll Warnock, be electrocuted until you are dead. You please step over to the bailiff for fingerprinting, ma'am. We did a lot, of, you know, a lot of talk and a lot of people um, didn't like the death penalty. You know, they said, you know, they were in favor, but it was, they just didn't like it. But based on what she's done, you know, we thought about her victims and all the evidence we've seen and the first, you know, that Pam presented. There's just no way, uh, it was hard to make the decision and everybody did a lot of soul search and some of us prayed because uh, there'll be a piece of what you make. Pamela Mills was the forewoman on this jury and she says that although it took the jury less than two hours to recommend the death penalty, deliberations were agonizing. After we had cried, after we had calmed down and we deliberated and talked and thought. And then I decided it was the time to take a vote. And we wrote it out. And one person, I'm not sure I should be telling what went on in the jury room, but one person said, uh, should we put one for death and two for life? And I said, no, if you've got, if you've got the nerve to vote for death, you should be able to write it out on a piece of paper. And we all wrote it out. They handed it in. And a gentleman, one of the jurors sitting beside him, he had a pencil and paper, and I opened each piece of paper and read off. And the time I got to the 12th death, I was pretty well emotional. And then what you do? And I cried some more. And then I, after we all calmed down, and I, I asked, you know, oh, well, is there anyone that has any, any doubt, any wavering, anything? You know, and no one answered. So 
So I started filling out the paper. And when I got down to where I had to sign my name, I said, this is the last chance. You know, when I sign my name, this is final. And they verbally, you know, I like to support, you know, no, there is no, no chance. The jurors said there was virtually no debate. All agreed Warnos was guilty of premeditated murder and that she deserved a death sentence. I think she is a, a sick person, uh, but I think she knew right from wrong when she committed the crime. Not sick enough to be spared? No, I don't think so. There was some talk in the jury room about the fact that there are a lot of people on the street who probably have mental impairment that is worse and still function very successfully in society. From what she did, there wasn't no other way. I mean, she took a life. I and mean, she admitted to taking another life. And she, somebody, when she started the first couple of times, maybe she didn't mean to kill him. But when she goes around the car and she shoots more, you know, she knew right then she was going to kill him. The jurors then did not believe Eileen Warnes' claim of self-defense. They did not believe that Eileen Warnes' mental problems should prevent her from being convicted and executed for her crime. And so the woman the FBI calls the first female serial killer is sentenced to death for what the state says is the first in a series of murders. For Court TV, I'm Greg Jarrett.